Welcome. My name is Jason Ferberg. I'm a production sound mixer, and I'm going to be moderating this event. Uh, I want to say thank you to Owen Curtin and AES and Soundtrack for letting us check out their space and use this space. Um, so I'm a production sound mixer. I work on set, recording dialogue. Uh, and I'm going to pass it down the line, and everybody can say oh. their name and what they do. Um, Kelly Doran. I'm a boom operator. I work on films and commercials in town and across the country, sometimes out of the country. All right. Uh, for a while. <laughs> well, I'm Kaylee Ristopin. I'm the executive producer here at Soundtrack. So I handle all of the scheduling and pretty much the conception of a job into the end of it. My name is Brian McKeever, and uh, upon my release from prison, they gave me a choice to work <laughs> in either audio post production or at a strip club, and I decided to work in audio post because it seemed a little more uh, seeming. Um, and uh, more exciting. yeah, and I uh, I make sound for television and film and radio and interactive stuff, and uh, I like doing that. Um, I've been at Soundtrack for 25 years, two months, and four days. Wow. <laughs> okay. I can't follow that. Um, <laughs> we were in prison together. <laughs> I'm Chris Anderson. I'm uh, an audio post guy primarily. I work at WGBH part time. I have my own company, Harpswell Sound. I do sound supervision on films, but I also occasionally work on set. I'm part of 481 and uh, do on set playback for when they need music for actors to dance or sing. So I have a foot in all worlds here. Excellent. Yeah, and many of us, well, I guess the three of us are Local 481, um, which is the, the union that covers production, uh, film and stage production. Um, and then I imagine that you are in 700. No. <laughs> yeah, we unionize our owner would, would murder us. Fair enough. Fair enough. There's no, there's no, there's no. <laughs> All right, and then, but I, Chris is in. I'm in 700, 700 and also Maybet's uh, 18 at, at WGBH, so. Unfortunately for some, uh, a lot of commercial productions are union on the set and then do their post-production non-union. Um, so sometimes that's just the way it is. Um, so I wanted to open it up for any kind of questions or any, any discussion, um, and I'm happy to, to lead the discussion, but do you guys have any questions uh, as, as you went on the tour? Did you see anything, anything specifically sound, I guess, and maybe not, we can't answer any questions about compositing right now. If Kyle's here, he can. <laughs> Kyle's not here. Um, okay, well, Chris, why don't we, why don't we start with you. Um, I know you had kind of an interesting experience on uh, Polka King with Jack Black doing playback, so can you tell us a little bit about, I don't know if any of you have seen this, it's on Netflix, fantastic movie called Polka King that was shot in Rhode Island. Yeah. Um, Kevin Parker was a sound mixer and Chris did some uh, yeah, I, audio playback. Yeah, I had two weeks on that set, and the interesting thing about that, it, it chronicled the real life of Jan Levan, who was kind of a scam artist, <laughs> um, and a polka guy, and he was the polka king of Pennsylvania for a while, while he was also raising money. It, you gotta see the movie. Um, but it was two weeks of me providing playback for, it, his music was polka, but it was essentially big band polka. It was, you know, full brass section. It was it was 17 piece band at, at parts. So I had music supervisors telling me what to do. Here's the cut, we're gonna play today. Um, usually it was tempo mapped, and I would provide uh, a feed for what we call earwigs. They're made by a company called Phonak, these little wireless receiver things, and everybody in the band who was on stage had them. They were also real musicians, so they could fake it and look like they knew what they were doing. Um, so I had that going. I had PA available, so we could put it up into the air, and then, you know, everybody could, everybody polka. Um, pull that out of the air if I had to. The musicians were always hearing it in, in their Phonaks, but I also had a, a thumper rig set up, so I've got a 1,000 watt QSC subwoofer, and the click that Pro Tools outputs has enough low frequency content that it'll, it'll fire up the thump, so you get a nice 50 hertz boom, 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 and everybody in the room can feel it and dance and be on time, and we can filter it right out of the mics if we're trying to get dialogue, so it was a lot of fun. Kelly was on that shoot with me, and I think she worked harder than I did. <laughs> More than two weeks. And Kelly always yeah, works harder than a lot everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Kelly was the hardest working person on that set. Um, I just get to hit play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Kelly often works for me as my boom operator, uh, for me, with me as my boom operator. And I'd say nine out of ten shows, Kelly has to put on waders at some point and go out into the water. So that's always my joke. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> unexpectedly. Yeah, Kelly works harder than everybody because yeah. she always has to be right in the middle of it. Whereas 
I can kind of be around a corner, and sometimes these guys, you know, don't even have to be up there. So it gets a little crazy on set. Um, let's see. Kayla, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, I know that production is crazy, and a lot of times I'll get a call for a commercial maybe just the day before, mm -hmm. or even the day of, where it's like, we didn't know we needed sound today. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how crazy it is to try to schedule everything that you have to schedule upstairs. Sure, so we are primarily post-production. So yeah, most of the time projects, we do get a schedule ahead of time. People, the producers on uh, the jobs will put time on hold, but oftentimes there are these kind of last minute things where it's like, oh, okay, I need a recorded mix tomorrow. <laughs> Surprise, I need you to find a studio in LA, I need to find a studio Dominican in Republic. the Dominican Republic. Yesterday. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we want to record tomorrow. Let's try and find a studio in another country. So a lot of my job is trying to put all of those pieces together and make sure that the record can actually happen. Um, so that's coordinating with all of those other studios and making sure they have all the elements and making sure we can connect um, via ISDN, Source Connect, whatever we can um, to make sure that we get the best possible audio um, all on a timely manner that works for almost everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. And how many rooms do you run upstairs? Seven. 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 Okay, between the two um, Yeah, and one ADR stage, um, and then six studios fully able to do um, pretty much all of your needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Very cool. Um, any questions from, please? How do you schedule out the work to the various engineers? Is it kind of an opt-in or? Um, so most of our clients are ad agencies uh, and each engineer has pretty much their clients. Um, clients that prefer to work with them. So their clients' clients are used <laughs> to their workflow. Um, so scheduling it out, you kind of do it in a puzzle way that you try and get them into their primary engineer. If that doesn't work, you try and get them into their secondary preference and you kind of try and move things around to uh, make everybody happy. So it's going back to the client and being like, listen, I have another client who's trying to get in at this time. Do you have any kind of flexibility? I'm trying to make everybody happy here um, and get everybody's needs taken care of. Her job is really hard. <laughs> I, I deal with one client. At a time. She deals with a minimum of seven to fifteen a day. Mm -hmm. It has to make. Oh, I make one person happy. I'm good. Like I'm, <laughs> I did my thing. She has to make them all happy, and they all have schedules and budgets. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, your job's hard and, and thankless. I might add. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we thank her. How do you get the stuff from the set generally? Like a good question. What? Like the media from yeah. the set. So usually we get it in um, like OMFs, AAFs that we get from the production houses. So they will take care of all the edits, oh, and then they'll put, they'll send us all of those files, so we get a full things. And sometimes we'll request if the engineer particularly requests it, we'll get um, the production audio. But we usually get it either from the agency yep. or the production houses. Yep. Mm -hmm. So somebody will do dailies or somebody will do Yeah, that, and uh, we'll get the everything from them. So yeah. they'll, they'll receive dailies, which dailies are when you're on set, um, you're recording, I'm recording sound, camera's recording picture at the end of the day. They synchronize that, they put them into, now they'd be files, so that the director and the producers can go back and watch. And so when they receive what they'd say, uh, the sound from the dailies or, or anything from the dailies, that's what that is, is coming, basically the media coming straight off set um, that needs to be turned around to be seen again by the production as soon as possible. And then I believe editors would go ahead and work with that mm -hmm. media after, right? So yeah. It's, yeah, we don't usually deal with yeah. that portion. We we usually it's the after. Yeah, it goes through all. If the we're dealing with that portion, something is going. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we're going back and digging through takes to find the one take where they didn't say that word or mm -hmm. uh, where we don't have a noise or something. Where you know it's sort of a little more forensic at that point. Sure, so sure. They've, yeah. It's been distilled by the time it gets to us. Hopefully, yeah. Especially because the pace of our workflow. I mean, sessions come in. We start at nine. By noon, the spot's done and it's going to be shipped. It's it's a very wow. you know we're the end of the process. Every delay inherited, every mm -hmm. budget issue is inherited because we're the last step. Um, and so, so it's not good if we're asking for the production okay. audio. Truth. Really yeah. not good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because an editor should have that kind mm -hmm. of all lined up for you and know what you need. It yeah. seems like, I mean, from, so my direct point of contact on a feature film is usually a picture editor um, because they usually haven't hired anybody in sound post until after. Mm -hmm. So, but what I've, what I've found as I get and deal with more experienced picture editors is that they know a lot about what their sound editors are going to want and, and they must work with them very closely 
to probably, like you say, you know, leave no time left behind when you're when you're at crunch time. Mm -hmm. An organization, I mean, I'm out there recording, you know, four, eight, twelve tracks, cameras recording two, three cameras at a time. Organization of media is incredibly important, especially, I'm sure, to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, the more organized it is, the more efficient it is, mm -hmm. uh, because time is money. Certainly. Um, so we don't want, if it's unorganized, it's ultimately going to cost the client more money. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. So it, I would also add, it's kind of the nature of the process that by the time the picture has been cut before it's mixed, the editor is being asked to do a lot more these days than they used to be. That, you know, they just kind of slog it together and fix it in the mix. You know, how many times have we heard that? Um, so they're, they're doing some mixing and sometimes even some sound design. You know, they're, they're making some closer to final choices there anyway, if not final choices, certainly sure. on voice takes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a much more polished result than those of us old people who remember <laughs> starting with tape based. Well not having to do a conform. <laughs> and you know, not having to the fact that, that we yeah. would we have multi channel audio from you that gets all the way through the edit process from the editors um, you know, system to us, so that then we can pick the best mics for the takes, as mm -hmm. opposed to getting a composite, you know, mix, and then have to go back and grab all those pieces and do a conform. Conforms weren't fun. Auto conform was slightly less painful, but now having that stuff come in as part of the OMF for AF is a big time saver. Yeah, um, it's great. Yeah, as long as they can pick <laughs> the takes. <laughs> so obviously, on the high level productions, you're still dealing with time code, but like. You know, I'm just running two just two cards, and I'll sync them up when I get home. Yeah. And so many little productions are doing it. How how far up the food chain if people said no more time code and just forget about it? It uh, for me, it really depends on the production, and I guess it does kind of start at me at, at, on production. Um, so everybody wants time code, and everybody wants time code to match, and ideally, everybody would like time code and also a sync track on camera just for safety. So you know, and to speed up editorial. The disaster that happens every time you try to do that is that nobody's listening to the camera, that your battery dies, that your your thing, you know, your receiver gets hit and your gain staging is off, and then you have you're giving to the director of dailies that they're supposed to look at and hear your great work and they're hearing something totally wrong. And people have gotten fired because of silly stuff like that before. So, you know, it's um it can be tricky, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but so uh, I don't usually put receivers, sorry, I went up on a tangent. I don't usually put receivers on camera, and, and the argument there is exactly that, that I want somebody, and, and as you get into higher level productions, there's always somebody that's doing dailies. But I want somebody to do dailies to take the track that I'm listening to, the track that I'm recording, and sync that track, because I know it sounds like the track that I want to you know, I want to give to someone. Um, everybody always wants time code, though, because it expedites the workflow, because, yeah, you're still going to go back and look at the clap to make sure that everything's on. Sometimes you're off a of frame here and there. Um, but it's going to expedite putting everything together before, you know, and as they've said, as you go down the line, it's super important. Um, I know David Fincher, at least at one point, was not using slates at all, was just using uh, like an iPad or something with time code on it to flash to the camera because he figured out at the end of his day he lost 10 minutes to slating, and those were 10 minutes he wanted back. And there are some people that are perfectionists just like that, and those people, I think, are more dependent on a system that works well. There are some people and there are some technical situations where you're just going to take a slate with no numbers on it and you're going to go out there and somebody's going to sit down later and they're going to match the frames and it's going to take forever. And I don't know how they do it sometimes, but that's just that's just where you're at when production says no. You know, we rented a Black Magic or we rented a we rented a, a, a GoPro and we're going to shoot it because it's, you know, something funky, but there's no time code. You know, so the best I can do is put a smart slate in front of it and the editor can read the time code, but it's still going to be done by hand. And that does happen a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think Pluralize stuff like Pluralize has probably helped that. Pluralize takes the waveform, but then again, you still have to have sound on camera to do to use Pluralize. So it can be tricky. <laughs> uh, time code almost always. I mean, in in my experience now, almost always. The worst question that opens a Pandora's box of problems is, is that in sync? Yeah, yeah. The entire room now is judging sync. Everybody's got a different opinion. Everybody has a different opinion, <laughs> and you you immediately realize that the human lips make shapes and, and to sounds that don't seem to make any sense. So that, that opens a box of pain. So the minute that happens. So that's why we absolutely try to make the process as bulletproof as we can. Yeah. It's always a huge discussion before any shoot, you know, you can go on for days. Oh yeah, and even on sets, I mean, yeah. because of cameras now having processing time, like the RED camera specifically, at least the Scarlet, I don't know if it's still true, would have a different amount of frames that you would see delayed from the camera to the monitor 
you know, it would be different whether you, I think it was three if you were not recording and five if you are recording. So if you're sitting there with Comtext on, now I have to match my output to a five frame delay. Okay, fine. And now the director walks on set and is listening to those people directly and now they're hearing the delay. So it's like all these little things cause, you know, can cause sync problems that, that's why Kelly said, you know, you oftentimes work out the all the workflow at a camera test day, and then you send that it, you know, send that media to your editorial team, to your dailies team, to your editorial team, so to make sure that everything is working before you get there on set, and you know, you don't have time to fail. <laughs> I think there was a question here. Yeah. Um, I had a question for Kaylee earlier. You said a lot of the media, like the OMS, like started in another production house, and then come to you, so do they, they, they start there and then come to the soundtrack to kind of finish off? Is that how the process works? Yeah, uh, they're coming mostly from like the editing houses, uh, so they're not dealing with any of the audio. So they kind of pass on their whole project to us. So the, most so, of the video work is done at the places you've Yeah, okay. yeah, so we ultimately, I mean, it doesn't always happen, but we like to work from final picture. Yeah. So, <laughs> I did post for a very short period of time, and even I can plan. Yeah, I like Santa Claus and Easter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. That doesn't exactly happen all the time. Um, so, if there ever is a picture edit, um, pretty much we have to do it again, and it goes back to the editing house does that edit, and they send us again the OMF or the AF, and then we just adjust the mix and either do it again or it's pretty much you have to go back in. Yeah, you have to at least you conform to that new picture. You make yeah. the changes needed to final to final version two, my yes. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the mug? Yeah. There's a there's a great picture of a mug and it's like audio final version dot wave, audio final version yeah. two, <laughs> audio final version I swear, this is the last one, <laughs> FML. It's <laughs> good. Um, yeah. So you guys are kind of describing your roles on set as like pretty specialized, and so I'm curious like where how that arises, I guess, um, because I'm sure that there's obviously there are certain things like being a boom operator where it takes a lot of practice, um, but I'm curious like how much crossover and um, like as you like were to move through say like a hundred you know sound for picture engineers like. Is it really that rigid that you kind of pick one thing and you sort of perfect that, or kind of how does that? What are the aspects of the workflow that like necessitate that specialization? So your your question kind of is like I'm a production mixer, but I don't necessarily do any post. Like why am I? Why do I specifically? Yeah, for example, or like why why wouldn't you? You know, if, I guess this is kind of a silly question, but why wouldn't you try to do everything? Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. And I, I think actually I think that that's very smart because when I when I first started in college I would do the post to all my films that I did sound on and I you know with the organizational stuff it's like you know where everything is because you did it. Um, I, there's there's a lot of logistics uh, that that kind of come into that as to why like specifically for for a production sound mixer I own all my own equipment but it's very specific to being in the field and not in post production so I have you know a very large amount of equipment that I have to constantly be working. So you know, it, it lends itself to me meeting those people, and it's almost like production circles and post post circles are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing logistically that happened years ago was that um, in Los Angeles, uh, production mixers and post production mixers used to be in the same union, so they could do this, they could do the, both jobs, and then uh, the editors guild took production or post production all post production. So there are still some people that do it, and as I understand it, uh, years ago it must it used to be more common than it is now, and it's just, I think, I mean, you just kind of, like you say, you specialize. I own specific gear. Um, I can't speak for post, but I'm sure it's gonna be kind of similar. Yeah, I mean, it's the same reason that your, you know, your heart doesn't filter blood and your kidneys don't pump blood. Like, it's the, you know, there's certain tools that you have, and there's a, beyond just the tool set, there's also the reason why you do what you do. There's an adventure to location sound. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the, 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 the gorilla sense of what's gonna come at you. And yeah. Some people love doing that. I hate that. Um, I'm 20 steps from a keg of beer. Um, I'm in a, a temperature-controlled environment every day. I'm gonna get a job I, application. It's <laughs> not bad, right? Um, there's a reason I've been there for 25 years, two months, and four days. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm in a temperature-controlled environment. They bring me lunch. Um, I put together a puzzle every day. I get pieces from the stuff they create. I have a script. Uh, I have some amount of creativity that I get to bring to it and put something together from a script and some location sound and some temp tracks. Um, there's an adventure to that to me. Um, from the tool side of it, 
you know, there has been a bit of a a a, uh, a change where there's there's the things I can do now that I could never do before with video. Um, there's things that, that video editors can do with audio they can never do before, but there's still a mindset. I think it's almost like a like a different part of creativity. Painters aren't great sculptors, and sculptors aren't great painters, but they both create art. And you know, the craft of what we do, when you get to a point, there needs to be a specialty to it, because you really have to drill down. If you want to be good at this, if you want to have clients, you want to have a career in it, you have to find a piece of it that you're really, really good at and drive at that. Because there's a lot of people that can do things to a certain extent, you know, but then you get to the, to the, get to the real like, top-notch stuff, it's really specialties. I think a lot of mixers I've worked with would not be good at posts. I don't even know if they would know. Jason, brought, you know, Jason can do it, and he's done it. But a lot of them, I don't. Th I think they'd be lost, you know. And they, and they might do the rudimentary stuff, but they wouldn't know. And I think it also comes from years of like you've been doing it, and you know certain traps to avoid. Right. Exactly. Like you can see the, the pain coming from so far away. So you can't. Yeah. They're so specialized that way that it, you know it helps to have the experience. Well, and, and then it's honing your art. I mean, so yeah, I, right. I could step into Jason's shoes if I had to. And probably do a maybe possibly good job. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think you'd be better at my job than I could do well, well, I don't know. I mean, I've tried that before, and I've, I've tried <laughs> boom. And no, there's that. there's definitely an art and a technique that you get from just doing it every day. I'd be terrible at it. I'm good at like one thing. Like <laughs> it was what I do. I was like, having fun on set with somebody. I was helping a client out, and I was running the boom. And, we were like joking around and they were like, boom. And I was like, yeah, boom, I got this. <laughs> yelling at me because they can see the boom in the shot. It's like, oh, okay, boom, <laughs> got it. <laughs> yeah, uh, the misnomer that a boom operator is just a human mic stand, except Samuel L. Jackson did say that to you, that you were a human mic stand. Uh, he, he said my boom. Did I see her out there like a mic stand. Boom so we did, uh, Kelly and I did a movie <laughs> called Glass, which isn't out yet. And Samuel L. Jackson was in it, and we had to. He does not like to be wired. He just hates being wired. Um, a lot of actors do. I, I don't even need to get into it. But so he didn't want to be wired. There was, a, and and the the shot required him to be because it was in a room that was a laboratory. There's reflections on the left and right of glass cabinetry, so you could see the boom when we were getting it in deep. And the scene is that he comes in to he's the room. He's in a wheelchair, so he's well. So he comes in, the you know, guy's from standing, so it's I. Right, and he comes in. Oh, that's right. There were two people. He comes in deep anyway, so we had to wire Sam, and we wire him, and I'm checking the mics, and I always make sure not to have mics up, you know, or not to be listening to people when they don't want to be listened to, because it's just, you know, that'll get you in trouble. And uh, so I check his mic, and the only thing I hear him say is, do I really need to wear a mic? She's out there like a human mic stand. <laughs> That's, enough. That's enough Sam for today. Great. Um, but these are things that Kelly has to think about, and that, you know, boom operators have to think about, and, and another thing that makes that a very, very specialized skill is that you're out there with the camera department dealing with, you're dealing with sound, yeah, you want to get the, the mic in the best place for the best sound, but you're also dealing with shadows and you're dealing with reflections and you're dealing with using plant mics or wires, you know, and trying to make them as a mixer, trying to make them all sound m matching so that everything will match in the final mix. Um, and so boom operators have to deal with a lot of logistics that people don't ever think about and it's a very, very hard job. And Kelly got to go out and boom also in the desert all summer. <laughs> in the uh, well, woman utility yeah. for the Cohen brothers yeah. with playback. In the <laughs> Kelly sent oh, me a yeah. picture of the tent that they set up for her to get out of the lightning storm, and it was just in pieces on the ground. Well, they do this <laughs> thing if they see lightning now. It's you have you have to stop immediately stop work, but you can't take any of your gear. You have to shelter. They say shelter in place. So you have to either go to a safe place, but you have to leave all your gear which is really difficult, especially for the camera department, but the sound department. So we put a tent and they strapped it down with the, they have these great things in the desert that they use. And, and we, one of the Teamsters came and said, there's your tent. And then it was just destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> but he, they, somebody was out there and moved, at least moved the rig, you know, to another tent. So that was the sound rig. But yeah. So it didn't get wet. All right. That's good. Sorry. Um, so who's making the equipment choices, like decisions on microphone type? That would be on set, the production mixer. Okay. So that's what I do, yeah. Cool. Um, I tend to use uh, Sennheiser MKH50s for indoors. These are just my personal preferences. Um, I use a Sankin CS3E outside, and I use uh, typically Sankin Cos 11s for wires, for, for wireless mics. And all my mics are wired, even the boom, uh, or wireless, sorry, even the boom is wireless. Okay. Um, which I run off Electrosonics uh, cube transmitter just because you move so fast. I mean, a lot of people, and Kelly still works for people that wire the boom, but 
I can't imagine doing it. You just right. work so fast out there. Because wouldn't that be to like, you'd have a recorder with you basically, right? No, it still runs back to the mixer, but it's cabled all the way from the mixer, so it's a hard wire, so you wouldn't have any, yeah. yeah. You don't have any RF problems, but you have lots of other problems. Right. <laughs> when, I, when I first started working, it was all cable. There was no wireless. It was all cable. Yeah. Cable person. And now, like... And each mixer has, like, has their own mics and stuff, and, and then usually what happens is... You know, if I see what's going on in the set and where maybe we could hide something there or I know where everything's happening, then we'll have a discussion. I'll say, you, you want to use this or you want to do this? And then he'll make the decisions about what to do. Yeah, so we'll watch any rehearsals together and figure out whether we're going to play a mic or, you know. Oh, you have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I have, I have questions. Yeah. yeah. I can ask questions. Too, right? <laughs> I have questions. Um, two two-part questions. Issues. First is from the, for the production mixer kind of thing. Uh, what level of redundancy do you have out in the field? And then secondly, uh, the transmitters, the wireless stuff, do any of those have recorders in them? I know that was one a trend at one point. It's yeah, starting to be a trend. The, it's starting to be a trend. It's a, it's a patent battle right now. So one brand has it, Got it. and the others don't. Zaxcom? Yeah, Zaxcom. Yeah, Zaxcom. Yeah, Zaxcom has it. And they've patented miniature time code recorders body packs, which now is, there's going to be a lawsuit because I can't see how you could patent that. That's every recorder ever. Yeah. It's small, but anyway. Um, so some do, and so what the question was is, do the wireless mic packs have recorders built in so that if I have RF problems, if I have any kind of interference, I can still go back and get that recording. There are brands that do that. They have time code on them so that it will automatically synchronize um, and it just records. Uh, and and so. if, you know, if there's a problem from that transmitter to me, I can take the card out and, and pass it along. Um, yeah, it does. And, and redundancy-wise, um, it's always a discussion because it's like everything could be split in two. So, you know, like, do I have two recorders? I do, but where do I split out? I don't split out from the wires. I split out from the output of my recorder to actually just a second one that does the mix track. So it's really in case I hit, forget to hit record. Because if my main recorder goes down, it's still, or my wireless goes down, you know, still, like, there would be nothing. Right. It doesn't matter how many times I'm back, you know. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, and Zaxcom actually the, did have... One of the features of their Diva was that if you came out AES, I believe, and went into another Diva AES, even if the first Diva powered down, it could pass everything through. So there is that thought of, of some kind of redundant receiver that is useful, That's or redundant, cool. redundant recorder that is. Very cool. Why does your work flow, flow like, and um, how much information you get in advance from the production? Oh, good question. So I usually get the script, and that's, well, I, so if, let's say, you know, for tomorrow, I'll get a call sheet with the characters that are gonna be on it, the scenes that are gonna be on it. Now, any of that can change any time. A lot of times that'll depend on weather. If you're outside and it's raining, they might move you inside and pull people in. Um, so you kind of always have to be ready for everything, depending on how big the scope of the project. You know, if it's a one-day commercial, you know you're gonna be there for that day. Um, so you usually know who, how many people and what scenes you're shooting. And if you've read the script, you'll know, you know if anything's gonna change, you'll at least have an idea of what it's gonna change to, because you have the kind of the Bible there with you. Um, I record, uh, so all my wires and microphones come, um, they're wireless, to electrosonic transmitters. I have electrosonics receivers on my cart that go to a sound device of 688, um, and I use a uh, control surface to mix, um, and it just it records up to 12 channels and time code, and four mix tracks, so I can do a mix track and 12 uh, isolated mics. And then move down the line, I'd love to know what your workflow is like. My, my workflow? Yeah or, yeah, or the workflow. She has a workflow, sure. too. Well, fair enough. You, you probably have to stuff on. Oh, you want me to go? <laughs> uh, all right, well, you know, for a, tip, a session that would involve production sound, like location sound coming from you guys, uh, you know, uh, we will probably get uh, a little bit of advance notice in the sense of uh, an estimate that we might do for the client to figure out how much it would cost. Oh, well, this is, part of my, this is my Right, that's why I thought you'd go <laughs> first. Like, you're, you're the start of the whole process. I guess so, yeah. So a uh, client will either call or email. They'll ring up saying, I have this project. I'm trying to look for an estimate. Um, so they will lay out exactly what they're looking to do. Uh, for It varies for if we're doing... Um, a film or television spots or ADR, those all have different workflows. But uh, for like a commercial spot, they'll ring up, they tell me how many spots they're trying to do, um, whether if it's stereo and surround, if they're going to need ISDNs or anything, and then I plug all of those, well, then I ask an engineer what they think, how much time they're going to need to mix, and then I plug all those numbers in, and then bring that to the client, and then sometimes there will be some back and forth about negotiations with prices. Um, 
or scope. I mean, sometimes we get a script or a, we get storyboards for two spots that become six. Yes. Because of the evolution of the project from pre-production to production, they decide to shoot viral things and add stuff in. So mm -hmm. it is fluid, but we at least start with an idea. Yeah, um, yeah. So give them the estimate and they will come back to with any feedback that they have. If they have a tr budget that they're trying to stick to, they have any kind of flexibility. Um, that's usually pretty early in the process, then a few weeks goes by and they will put some time on hold. Um, most people have engineers that they like to work with, uh, so like McKeever has very specific clients that I try and make sure that they get holds with him. Um, and then they will, once the time gets closer, they'll ask me to put time on hold at other studios if they need to do any recordings, then I'll reach out to other studios to book any ISDNs. Um, and then, then they go and book the, um, the sessions and then start to ask, or the machine room starts to ask for them for elements and then it gets passed out to him. I uh, look at my schedule for tomorrow and it has stuff in it that she has put in with notes <laughs> and everything. I'll maybe look back on an email, she'll forward me something the producer sent the night before. Uh, and then uh, the next morning I gather whatever elements have been, been received by our machine room staff, our assistant engineers essentially. Um, and I'll do the intake part where I load stuff in, make sure that I have all the things I should have, hopefully. Um, that involves bringing in picture, making sure it's the right codex uh, for what we're doing. OMFs and AAFs, which are these, these uh, interchange format files that have all the sequence, the audio that the picture editor had. Um, Sometimes it'll start with cleanup before we ever get to the voice of record before the, even the client comes in I'll do cleanup. I'll do, you know, they've they've taken the best takes of all the stuff that you guys recorded and Sometimes that matches well sometimes it doesn't sometimes it's gaps They've opened things up so my job's the, the very least because dialogue is so crucial to the narrative and also the thing that we are most familiar with uh, from from birth onward, voice is the thing that we're most keyed into. So to make sure that that's even, to make sure that the the sound around it, the background, or any ambient stuff is is consistent, will go a long ways toward it feeling like it's a coherent piece and not a bunch of different edits. So then uh, you know any prep I can do ahead of time in terms of if they have music that was edited by the video editor, I may have to re-edit or at least clean up the edits. They may have a whole another piece of music that we're putting in, um, taking whatever sound effects or sound design that a video editor did and either manipulating that to fit well into the, to the mix or replacing it in many cases. Um, a lot of that stuff is temp, it's just meant to give a sense of what would be there. Um, we obviously have a, a very large collection of sound effects. We have the ability to do fully where we can add in things that are character created sounds. Uh, and then sound design where we're creating that which does not exist. Um, I did some stuff for Gordon's and there's no sound of the tail of a merman. There's these two <laughs> mer bros technically. Um, they're like lifting weights on the beach and stuff and they're, they're mermen. Uh, and the sound of their flapping tail wasn't something we had, so that meant going in the booth and finding something that sounded like that and recording it, slapping up against some, I have sand, I have 100 pounds of sand in my booth, so, in a box. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of work there to make that happen. And then, client comes in, kind of hear what we're doing, then we record a voiceover. And when she says ISDN, does anybody not know what ISDN means, or source, can anybody ever heard those? All right, ISDN is, it's an old technology, actually going to phase out in a couple of years. Um, I know, right? That, that doesn't make her feel good. Um, it stands for Integrated Services Digital Network. They're basically uh, copper pair lines that run data, kind of like DSL, except synchronous and a little better. Um, 25, actually almost 30 years ago, it became a, uh, a viable tool for us to be able to record, uh, get audio from another facility around the world. Um, New York, LA are frequent places we get audio from. Chicago regularly for me, sometimes Atlanta or Miami, we've done New London. Um, it's, a, it's, it's real time, it's full duplex. There's a, there is a propagation delay and the further away they are, it can be long, but it's not too bad. Um, you know, we, back in the 90s, I remember the, uh, the Frank Sinatra duets album, we recorded Carly Simon here. It was Phil Ramone out in LA sending the music out here and then her voice going back to him. They had to delay the music that they were hearing based on the propagation delay from her voice getting from Boston all the way to LA. Um, I did, a, I did an ISDN one time with a studio in India that was connecting by phone patch to a satellite phone on Base Camp 2 of Everest. Um, well, there was a thing that Nova was doing, and it was after a bunch of those climbers that were, should never have been climbing died, yeah, yeah. and I think it was Krakow was up there. And like, you know, first of all, it took forever to do the interview because the man can't breathe, you're you know, hypoxic. So, um, you know, that technology back in the 90s meant that clients didn't have to go to another city to record their talent, or the talent didn't have to flown and get a per diem the whole time they were with us. Uh, it wasn't a, you know, listening in on a phone and then having a, a 
FedEx of a DAT coming to you or some sort of audio tape was, uh, was, was gone, and it was amazing. You dial it up just like a phone. Prior to that, the only other telephony type thing we had was a transmission line to the local uh, telephone office, and I think it was like, it was like a I think 14K bandwidth. Um, you had to book it 24 hours in advance. You got it for whatever time you booked. There was no negotiation, like, oh, hey, we just need 10 more minutes. It, was, it, it came on like, like eight seconds before the hour. It went off uh, eight seconds before the hour. And there was no negotiating, and it was susceptible to sunspots and like solar activity and stuff. So yeah, right. I was really excited at one point because I was like, my job involves the space weather forecast. Like that was kind of, <laughs> never thought that would happen. Well, um, we still kind of have that when it rains in New York. Yeah, yeah, that's a function of New York, though. Um, you know, that's not as exciting as sunspots. You know, solar <laughs> wind. Exciting. You know, um, but uh, you know, coronal mass ejection. You know, like that's you know that's science stuff. But uh, but yeah, so the telephony thing. You know, once we once I've done my work to prep, we record a voiceover from somewhere around the world, and that talent uh, is interacting in real time. We can also do it by the internet now with a thing called Source Connect that uses TCP IP stuff to, to get it back and forth. Has some issues with propagation delay there that's much longer. Uh, you know, someone out on the West Coast, you say, hey, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? It creates a, you have to warn your clients of that stilted level of conversation. But once we've got that voice recorded and all the other elements are in place, I mix, and I mix for various formats, whether it's for television or radio, uh, interactive stuff. You mix to the format that you need to be going to. For example, I've got wonderful Genelec speakers. I'm the last person that's ever going to hear a TV spot on those. <laughs> so we have a crappy TV called Senior Crappy in the lounge, and Senior Crappy gets a feed of the audio. We watch it in there. It's, in a, it's a room that's not treated for sound, so it's a typical you know, crap apartment. That's your worst case scenario. Like, And because it's in another room, even when we're sitting in the mix room, it's kind of the way you hear commercials. You get up and leave and go make a sandwich or go to the bathroom. You're gonna hear a commercial from a room away. It's a very valid way to hear it. If, if the main thing is a viral thing that's gonna be on somebody's phone, we sent, we post it, they listen to it on their phone. That's the really, you have to judge it on that. Um, once, uh, once everybody in the room's happy, which is generally the advertising agency, uh, not a lot of actual end clients come to sessions anymore. They used to. It used to be everybody, every decision maker was in the room. Now, it's the agency people, the creatives from the agency, they're happy. They have a boss who then has to preview it, has, who gets an MP3 or gets a, a quick time or something. They watch it, they may have a comment, they may make a change. We go back, we make those changes, send it to again. Once they're happy, it goes to the brand team or the account people that interface with the client to make sure it meets all the criteria that they've been given by the client. If we get through that gatekeeper, we get to the actual client. So what could easily take like an hour and a half of my mix time can easily take five or six, which destroys the estimates that she so carefully creates. And then um, I have to go back to the client and explain why right. we came out over. Right. Um, these things happen. But that client then has that final say. And hopefully they trust their agency. Hopefully they trust whoever is creating this work for them. That you know, that you know, you, you hire a plumber to put in a toilet and you don't second guess everything they do. Uh, you hire an ad agency to create a branding campaign and you trust that they have a vision they're going to execute that will make your product stand out. And uh, the best clients trust and the ones that don't generally have a much harder birthing process. And we go through revisions and revisions and revisions sometimes. But in the end, uh, everybody's happy and, and we all get paid and go home. Is that the longest painstaking process of the whole creation? I got to tell you, it's the least fun part. Um, <laughs> because, you know, and then, honestly, part of it is that when everybody was in the room, everybody felt like they had a, a say in the process. Even if you just said, yeah, I like that voice, or like you were there, you were involved in it. There is a a principle of, of justifying your existence or your lunch, where you send something to somebody who's never seen it before, they had no part in this process of the, cre the actual meat and potatoes of creation, and they have to change something just to say, I helped out on that, I, made that. I, I helped make that. Like, you know, even though it's perfect as it is, it works perfectly and everybody would go out and buy that burger or get a Corolla or whatever it is they're going to do, um, they have to do something to change it. And some of the changes are, you know, sometimes they'll come up with a good idea. I'm not gonna say it's every time, but I would say a solid 80% of them are just like, all right, well, that's not gonna sell one more burger or yeah. one more car. It's just, it's different, but there's nothing empirically better about it. So hopefully it'll make it worse. I mean, the most heartbreaking thing is when you get an amazing piece of music that works great, you know, whether it's from a production library or a composer, and somebody well up the chain who is maybe not as skilled or understanding of the, the nuances of what music is, has a comment that goes way back to the point of either grabbing a different piece of music, 
that may be a little less exciting or more lackluster, just more generic. Generic is the worst part. When it's bland, who pays attention to bland, you know? You know, if I sat here and mumbled the whole time, that's way less exciting than if I start yelling, you know? Bland is boring, and we often, you know, the, the safe factor in advertising especially, you don't want to piss too many people off. You want to maybe get some some uh, some eyeballs on it because of something exciting, but there's a there's a trend sometimes toward the generic side of stuff that that's just ruins things, so that part hurts, yeah. Creating stuff's fun. I mean, I could do that all day. If I have to please anybody, pff, I'd be great. I kind of a general question. Sorry, were you going to go? Go for it. Sorry, uh, we didn't get all the way down the line. Uh, oh, uh, workflow, right? What he said. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my workflow is, I mean, I, I do a very similar thing. I don't deal with agencies as well as lucky. <laughs> um, a lot of my stuff is long form, so I'm mixing Nova, Frontline. Um, I do some dramatic films. I'm working on a feature right now. And I have to say, those are my favorite. My, my flow is like this, only way drawn out and a lot more time, where, you know, Brian might be able to knock out a spot in a day if everybody has their act together. I have six weeks to do a feature. So I'll, I'll get the film, and in this case, I was in on the script, so you know, I, I know how the shoot was supposed to go and then how it actually went, and 